I had the great pleasure of catching up with Professor Larissa Soldatova from Goldsmiths University. She's really interested in automating the process of science. And in order to do that, you need to know about logic, abduction, knowledge, and semantics. We see biology is so complex. We we still scratch in the surface trying to understand. And uh, there are not enough scientists in the world <laughs> to do it. And if we can have some AI help, that would be probably a good thing. So my presentation about reflecting on automation of science, uh, history of it, where we are with it now, how much we can automate now, and where we're probably heading towards. So I'm really interested in the philosophy of science, which is to say, what is the meta process that scientists go through when they do science? So science is about generating theories, explanations about how the world is this way and also how it's not that way. But science is based on empiricism, which is basically following the data, doing experiments and trying to discount hypotheses. But we still have this chicken and egg problem, which is where do the hypotheses come from? And this is very related to the bias variance trade-off in, in machine learning. Um, generally, we can't start from a blank slate. We can't start with nothing. We need to have some world knowledge to structure our search process. And then we run into trouble. You know, how much should we seed the system with priors and world knowledge? There are so many things in our physical world that it just feels like we should encode it into our systems. It'd be a waste of time not to. But then there are some, some things that we feel that the system should learn. But if we bias the system too much, then we might accrue a kind of approximation error because there are things that our system just won't be able to search because we've biased it too much. So there's always this trade-off between having the flexibility to find new things versus cutting down the search base. For you, the next big step will be when we will be able to consume more knowledge. So not just data, but if we start using what we know. Specific knowledge is the major source of machine and human intelligence and will suffice even with simple inference. Again, to reflect, so if you take the AI system, it's mostly taking lots of data. In the best case, it will take lots of different data, put it together, and then it outputs some predictive model or something else, or I don't know, piece of art. But knowledge is still hugely underused. No, one reason there is not much available in forms that computers can consume, but just imagine if even these new models were immediately fed back and could be an input, so it's called closed loop systems, and probably it would be more intelligent. So this is quite interesting. So going back to the 80s, the modus operandi in artificial intelligence was encoding knowledge into expert systems because we knew that if you could encode knowledge, you can deduce new knowledge and new facts from existing knowledge. So knowledge isn't just data. Knowledge is one level of, of abstraction higher where you actually know the relations and you can apply some kind of functions between data. The problem is it's very brittle. Uh, famously, Doug Lennett's created this project called the Psych uh, Project, which had millions and millions of facts and relations and things in it. And it was almost a complete waste of time. It was too brittle. It wasn't particularly useful. But empirically, though, we seem to be wasting our time with this blank slate approach because machine learning moved away from really any explicit domain knowledge and it just became these meta priors. So things like symmetries and, um, I don't know, learning uh, learning schedules and weight decay and stuff like that. And the, the models only had very abstract priors in the sense of how to learn things statistically. They didn't have any domain knowledge at all. But there are so many things in our physical world that we just understand and we should be able to explicitly code into our system. But we have this paradox, which is that every time we try and encode high level knowledge into systems, it just introduces brittleness. And this is what Rich uh, Sutton warned against in his Bitter Lesson essay. What's the difference for you between data and knowledge? 
Uh, yes, it's a good question. And uh, in different textbooks, you actually can find different definitions. But people who are working in knowledge representations, they have very clear idea. So they take facts. Knowledge, it's when you go level up, it's like rules, relations, ultimately better if you have models, better if you have executable models. So you can put something in, get something out. So th this is knowledge. A lot of knowledge you can discover directly from data. If you have a lot of data, you can discover these rules, you can construct models. But why don't represent it immediately as knowledge if we already know it? Why? why? It's very inefficient way. It takes a lot of energy, these neural networks, they are destroying the planet. And you actually can encode a lot what we know in quite compact way. And, if, and you can reuse it. A lot of what we know actually is not in the data. Just an example, I like my uh, collaborator gave this example, like uh, they were modeling ecological systems and you can have a lot of data and you can discover from data that bear has between two and five cups and if it's monos, it's less cup. But why bother if we know it, just encode it as a knowledge? So you can extract it, but you also can just encode immediately. And you can encode a lot additionally what is not in the data. That is why it's more powerful and promising. Larissa spoke about a project about 60 years ago to automate the scientific discovery of chemical compounds. Um, not too dissimilar, actually, to AlphaFold which uh, came out recently from DeepMind. But anyway, she's kind of saying that, you know, if you look at how these systems work today, it's not dramatically different than it was 60 years ago. What chemists would do, and they put in place a whole pipeline, knowledge acquisition, also giving output in forms that is uh, good for users, in this case, Chemist, it really produced very interesting, promising chemical structures. Moreover, the system actually was multi agents It was heuristic dendral, method dendral, and it was closed loop. So whatever it managed to discover, it immediately was going back and improved over time. So it was 60 years ago, and I would claim we haven't progressed much further. Of course, the were other fantastic systems, but the underlying architecture in, and principle how it operate, operates is still the same. So it's called the robot scientist. And this was introduced again 15, 20 years ago now. So the idea is to develop a system, AI system, that is capable of generating hypotheses, designing experiments, having real robotic labs to carry out these experiments, analyze results, do it in cycle, and hopefully discover something new. So it's a lot of data, external data, whatever data sets are relevant, plus internally produced because it's a robotic lab, very powerful, that can run in parallel, like 1,000 biologists working in parallel in that lab. But it also has this knowledge, formalized knowledge. It has domain knowledge, uh, the first system worked with yeast biology, but it also had this knowledge about what scientific discovery is, what key elements, how they're connected, what you need to do, just like our experimental practices, how to design experiments. So you need to explain to machine at all. So in science, we need to do abduction. Uh, this is absolutely delicious because you've heard us speak about abduction Ad, ad nauseum on MLST and, and Larissa is out there talking about it which is wonderful but yeah um, you have to start with a hypothesis or a set of hypotheses in, in science before you do inference right so inference is when you kind of learn mappings from hypotheses but abduction is how you first select the relevant hypotheses right hypotheses that could generate powerful explanations for some phenomena and it's very creative. It's very mysterious. So what is the Logician 101 definition of abduction? Well, it's reasoning to the best explanation. Is that helpful? Maybe. Maybe. I love the kind of cognitive science view on things, which is, you know, an explanation. It's a causal model 
which helps us understand the world because it gives explanatory power. It carves the world up by the joints. Why is the world this way? Why is the world not that way? And the raw building materials of these theories are cognitive priors, and they're the same kind of priors that we imbue into machine learning models. Noam Chomsky says that some of these priors are built into our brains. Um, I'm a big fan that many of the priors are socially embedded. They're like software that float around mimetically. But anyway, abduction is about you have a bunch of priors in a system, and we as humans have this magical ability to grab the relevant priors, stick them together into small models that give explanatory power, and selecting a few of those models, and that's what we do when we do abduction. Um, so the key question is basically, can we automate that in a machine? I will focus on hypotheses because in philosophy of science, for a long time, it was considered that it's something that you cannot automate, so only humans can do it. And uh, to enable this uh, hypothesis generation, so you need to go out of system, out of what you already know. So you cannot use uh, conventional logic like deduction. You need to use something else. So Adam used abduction. So there are other logics that you can use, but you need to go outside of the system. So to have these guesses and then try to see if some of it makes sense or not. It's uh, not trivial. Focusing on hypotheses, so like you want uh, to test hypotheses that this particular gene has that function, but you actually cannot put gene into well, or you cannot measure function. So you start doing some inferences. What if we replace it to so use some proxy, if we use something with this gene knocked out, and if we put metabolites and... So yeah, you go deeper, deeper, deeper. So biologists do it just normal practices, but when you try to explain it to computer how to do it, you, you really need to think, so what, what steps were, were taken? We actually very rarely experiment with something what we make conclusion about. So our conclusions are not always accurate, so then you have to go back. So it was very interesting, no, first try to automate it, and then also reflect on how humans are doing science, especially experimental science. There are many levels to this as well. So if you if you want to go and get a job at Google now, they already have a bit of a meritocracy which is based on kind of what we're talking about here. To be very senior at Google, you need to find people. And to be one step below that, you need to find the areas. And below that, you need to solve abstract problems. And then below that, you need to solve specific problems. So there's a kind of hierarchy in the amount of creativity and ambiguity that you can tolerate. And that's what scientists do. So they're always traversing these levels. Abduction is about finding the areas. And then once you perform inference on these hypotheses that you have abducted, then that's solving a much more specific problem. And it gets more and more specific. The key point is that science is combinatorially exponentially expensive just to run experiments. And there isn't enough time in the world. There aren't enough scientists in the world. Yes, having AI scientists can help us, but we still need to always reflexively and abstractly go one level up. We always need to be asking ourselves the question, can we do this better? If we had a different perspective or a different view, could we make this more efficient? Could we make this more efficient? And then could we make this more efficient? And that's what we humans can do. And that's what we need to imbue into AI robot scientists. When you need to test like five, six drugs work on this combination. So yes, it's a combinatorical problem. If you do it in a lab, we just don't have enough cells in our blood to run all this experiment. So this is a justification when you need such system, you first do reasoning based on all what we know, with all these gaps, contradictions, but the best what you can do, output some plausible hypothesis, what should work in this situation. Then you can do some simulation again, the computational, come up with some hundred, several hundred hypotheses that then you can automatically test. So th that is a cheaper way of doing it using robotics. Yeah, so I'm really interested in this idea of human cyborgs, basically, where humans and AIs work together. The problem is, it's not easy to say that 
combining humans and AIs together produces more productivity? It probably does, but we don't know for sure. There was a, a piece out by ThoughtWorks recently where they were talking about generative AI or co-pilot making developers two times more productive. How do they measure that, right? Software engineering is not a reducible activity. It's a very complex phenomenon. And people have tried to measure the productivity of software engineers for many years. How many lines of code do they write and you know, the storyboard and issue tracking and stuff like that. It's all rubbish. And the reason for that is it's a very complex, irreducible phenomenon. And therein lies the problem. There's a meme going around on LinkedIn at the moment talking about how with Copilot, you can generate the code 10 times faster, but you then spend 10 times more time debugging the code. And that's because there's a technical debt, a new type of technical debt, understanding debt, right? You generated all of this code and it works. And then in order to fix a problem, you need to actually understand it. And the knowledge, the mental model is not in the code. Actually, in any software engineering project, the mental model is a mimetic social thing. It's in the brains of the developers and it kind of floats around in the ether. It's not in the code. So, yeah, it's, it's a similar thing here that if we had an AI robotic scientist, how would we know that it's making us go faster? I don't think such system will replace human, as you see. At the best, uh, they can automate some some science, some uh, experiment, experimental driven science. But uh, it's it's important part of science, and uh, if it can be automated, it will be of great help. Uh, humans still have distinct advantages in many areas. Hopefully we will retain it, but uh, ultimately the best way is to work together, take advantage and uh, really work as a team. And then maybe we can make a faster progress. Welcome to MLST. So we are here with Professor Larissa Soldatova. And Larissa joined Goldsmiths in November, uh, November 2017 as a director of the Online Masters in Data Science program. She's an internationally rec recognized expert in artificial intelligence, particularly in discovery science, reasoning, knowledge representation, and semantic technologies. And Larissa's also uh, been working on the Robot Scientist Project, which investigates uh, which processes of scientific discovery can be automated and how robotic and human scientists can work together. And the robot scientist Adam was the first system which made an, auto an autonomous scientific discovery. Uh, she's also involved in a number of international projects in the development of semantic standards, for example, the machine learning schema, the robotics task ontology standard, and um, also the laboratory protocols exact. So um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Larissa. Maybe you could just start off by telling us about the event and, and your talk today. My talk was about uh, where we are with automating science. So mm -hmm. yes, it's very creative endeavor to do science, but there are parts of it that uh, scientists try to automate for a long time. So the history of uh, scientific discovery as a subject of computer science. It's actually more than half a century old. And the first systems were developed in 60s in Stanford. So the first system, it was inspired by the need uh, to go to other planets, collect samples, like if you go to Mars, uh, and uh, you cannot send uh, many samples back. Mm -hmm. uh, if you send data, so what you manage to analyze, uh, it will take so long to send it to human scientists to get some instructions what to do next. So that what stimulates the development of autonomous intelligent systems that needs to collect something, do something, decide what to do next, what it means. And um, uh, since then, there was a slow but steady progress. And uh, so the system that we are working on, it's already for over 20 years. Yes, it's called Robot Scientist. And yes, the first was Adam. It's actually stand for adaptive machines. But yeah, Adam, <laughs> because, it, <laughs> because it was the first. Not, not to be confused with the other Adam for um, training neural networks. 
Yes, it's a good point. So the principle of such system is that they're very knowledge intensive. Hmm. So we hear a lot about progress in AI, but it's mostly data driven. So now we have so much data and also computational power, so it all can be processed and something useful output. And uh, I believe that the next step will be when a lot of knowledge will be available mm. in the form that computers can take. So right now they're taking data. If we can give our knowledge and let them to reason with it, so that will be just... And to do scientific discovery, of course, you need to have knowledge. Scientists, so why is there <laughs> still in short supply? Because it takes like 25 years uh, to produce yes. <laughs> one. You need to educate. It's many, many years of studying. And uh, if we can create systems and also knowledge models, uh, uh, starting from some domain knowledge, so in some particular areas. So we are working with biological systems. So if you can encode in machine processable form what we know, and also encode how we do science. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how we formulate hypothesis. Of course, not any, but uh, at least some. It's actually quite algorithmic. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'd, lo I'd love to know more about that. So you said some really interesting yeah. things. I mean, first of all, as you say, if we want to learn about Mars, it's yes. very sample inefficient because it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the purpose of science. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the purpose of science is about generating um, intelligible explanations. And then we get to knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think you were just alluding mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. data and information is not knowledge. And I know you're an expert in knowledge representation. So, yes. so perhaps so, perhaps we could just touch on, does knowledge mm -hmm. have some primacy over just normal information? Okay, so it's very true that different textbooks will give different definition. And sometimes there is no distinction between data information. It's like synonym. But yes, in my area of research where very clear about it <laughs> naturally. So what we consider data is facts. Yes. So this gene has this function. The duck is a bird. <laughs> so knowledge is when you go further. So when you have rules, when you have uh, like uh, even connections or links between facts, you can go further, yes, more knowledge model like uh, if you have a lot of data house prices in this area how it was affected uh, i don't know by flooding or so they dropped how much then then you can detect this patterns so if mm -hmm. you so this is knowledge so if there is flooding in area prices will drop <laughs> so this is a rule and uh, you can represented in various forms so if we can represent it in forms that you can <laughs> put it <laughs> into memory <laughs> of computers then it can be used and if it can be used together with data if you have all these components that it will be even more intelligent <laughs> interesting I, I guess um where i was going with the question a little bit was also mm -hmm. can knowledge be probabilistic of course, all oh. our knowledge probabilistic. We, we are not certain about anything, even if we think, yes, this is a state of the art. So much knowledge was changed, was refuted. So we always work in this probabilistic framework, just we not always reflect on it. Int but if you want to build a system that really outputs something, it is underlined to so the other side of working on such system, it uh, gives you a chance to understand better about what science is. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, there are no guaranteed truths. It's just what we believe in at this point, given all data we have and other series. So it's just work together. But it can yeah. change in future. Yeah, it can. I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, because um, rationalists think that there is only certainty. You either know it or you don't. And then 
I believe that, you know, mm-hmm. Bayesian mm-hmm. reasoning is kind of like the, it, it's an extension of logical reasoning in the domain of uncertainty. Absolutely correct. And it's important to remember about it. It's important to remember even when, uh, of course, when we read newspapers, but uh, even scientific articles. So scientists actually tend to overgeneralize or <laughs> they are very excited about what they discovered. It's important to stand, step back and think that, yes, it actually can be refuted. It can be only one explanation. So, and if you look at history of science, <laughs> just <laughs> in Newtonian physics, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it looked like the ultimate truth. And then, no, <laughs> the theory of relativity turned it all upside down. It's only some fraction of it. <laughs> yes. To, to what extent should knowledge be grounded in the physical world? Uh, so the whole science, it has to be verifiable. Hmm. So you, you can imagine, imagine many things uh, plausible, but unless you really show that this corresponds to reality, we cannot trust it. Of course, it can be still, there can be maybe another explanation, but at least this is connected to what we observe, or even better, if we can design an experiment to, to, to show there is something behind it. So this is how science uh, always worked. Of course, I refer to experimental science, like biology, physics, where you can actually can too. So there are thought experiments, so we will not go there. <laughs> so you cannot build a, <laughs> an automated system to do that. So Interesting. But, uh, I, I wondered whether you would define yourself as a neat or a scruffy when it comes to knowledge representation. I mean, for example, if I define, uh, and by the way, a neat is um, like a puritanical, mm-hmm. simple underlying principle, parsimony. So if I wanted to define a chair, I could think of thousands of different analogies to describe a chair. Do, do you, is it collapsible or is it just very complicated? I am a very neat and I can give <laughs> you a perfect example how to model a chair. Go on. So I'm very neat because we work with these reasoning systems and they need sharp, clean logic. Yes. And if you complicate matters, it complicates reasoning. A chance that something will be really discovered and we want to connect different bits of knowledge, different data. So the more streamlined it is, the better. And if you use uh, like uh, minimum of, of relations and so so over years, I just learned to think that way. And about chair, it's actually examples that I used in my lectures when I was explaining oh, to students. Wonderful. So I was showing them just examples. So these are chairs. They can look very differently. Some yeah. don't have yeah. any legs. Some have three legs. So, <laughs> so how to explain computers? This is a chair. Yes. So you can, yes, you can represent by many, many, many ways, but uh, a good knowledge model will focus what we call intrinsic property. Mm-hmm. What makes it a chair? Give me an example. What makes it a chair? It's function to be seated on. So it's a relational model. So it was design it was produced for it yeah this so is it so can interesting, take yeah. many shapes many colors but this is what defines a chair so and because we produced it human so we, we can say this is uh, its function so and all other yes it can have other properties like what color it is what shape but ultimately that's what makes it a chair Yes, yes. Because when I hear philosophers talking about semantics, they they have to come up with some kind of a relational model, and they and they will choose the view of function or purpose is another good one. And I guess what I'm saying is that it's a little bit anthropocentric, and th- like a function. For example, a hospital. That building used to be a hospital, but it's not a hospital anymore. But again, uh, why it is. Uh so centric because it's us who made it 
So we have control over it. Yes, it was hospital. Now it's no more hospital. Some social convention, some decision, decision was made. It was repurposed. Hmm. Now it is not hospital. It's something else. But if you take biological systems, like gene function, we have nothing to do with that. It mm. evolved to be there. It's still, still, it's still intrinsic property of it, what function it has, what it's for. Otherwise, you can be very far. Like, uh, again, going back to a chair, I can sit on a table. It yeah. doesn't make it a chair because it's not primarily function. This is not what this was made for. Yes, yes. So if you ha if you agree to it, you, you need to have this clarity, also agreement that this is how you model things. Then you start to have consistency. What is a chair? What is a table? Because if you want to have intelligent system to design your office, for example, yes. so how will it do? How it will distinguish what is what? <laughs> So this is quite similar in principle to Wittgenstein said that the the meaning of a word is in its use. And um, I'm friends with a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. Mark Bishop, who says the oh, meaning of computation is in its use. <laughs> and but that's a very kind of relativistic, social emergentist kind of view. I, I guess what I'm saying is, do you think there's mm -hmm. a platonic meaning? So for me, it's very easy to answer on these questions because I actually working on development of real systems that need to take it, reason with it, and produce mm -hmm. something. Justification of what we are doing and how we are doing, it works. Yeah. You can do it differently. You can take different points of view. Let's design a different system based on it and then compare what is better. No one ha has done it. So yeah. this is what is done, how it's done, it's working. <laughs> Okay, okay, so but that's very pragmatic. Yes, yeah. I would say it's not uh, relativist, it's, not, it's pragmatic approach to producing knowledge in machine consumable form. It's not optimal, it's not the best, but it's something what good that computers can work with and produce something. I think he might be a closet scruffy. <laughs> um, okay, are you familiar with the Psych Project from Doug Leonard? I think so. <laughs> I'm sure it's, just, it's, it's almost like uh, preaching to the choir. But um, what what kind of retrospective comments do you have about that project? I think they just attempted to do too much. Right. So it, it's like in AI. So this was. Uh, constant generic AI yeah. uh, versus something practical, fragmented. So, of course, it's wonderful to have a system that can solve any task. For that, you need such knowledge, knowledge models. Mm -hmm. But just not say yet. <laughs> yes. Maybe in the future. Right now, we're trying to model some fragments, some domains of knowledge. And if we have enough drag, uh, such fragments, hopefully we can combine. But ultimately, if you want to have a general AI, you will need such like interesting models. One contrast people make is, uh, I mean, I, I have friends who are in the domain of certainty, so they think knowledge is either mm -hmm. you know it or you didn't. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they give and the reason why they don't like language models is mm -hmm. because they say, well, when you have actual knowledge, so you actually know, you can deduce new facts and new knowledge. So you, mm -hmm. can, you can create more knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they would say with a language model, because it's only pretending to reason, you can't <laughs> create any new knowledge with it. Uh, it's actually an advantage. We already started using it to generate hypotheses. Yes. Because it's not rigid uh, deduction. It is how you can actually make new guesses. And then some of them might be true. You just need to experiment to show it. So we already started. We generated some very interesting hypothesis we have already organizing experiments to test them yes um i i believe that science is about abduction you know so like creating this mm -hmm. plausible set of yes. hypotheses mm -hmm. and we're at an event all about creativity mm -hmm. and humans have that spark of inspiration don't they they we just have an idea about plausible hypotheses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe maybe the world is quite mm -hmm sclerotic and predictable and boring 
But do you think that there's some spark that we won't get from AI? Uh, I completely agree with you, and it's exactly what we use. Uh, we use abduction in our reasoning system to generate hypotheses. Yes. So in some simple uh, application areas, like uh, in drug design, you use induction. You just have many, many, many examples uh, yeah. what chemical structures should activity so you can, if you see similar structure, you induce that it might show similar activity again. It's not always. So this is still, it's not, you cannot infer ultimate truth. That is why you need experiments. Mm -hmm. But abduction, yes, this is something that takes you outside of what you already know, yes. Yes. I, yes. I completely agree. I think it's the most exciting <laughs> part. <laughs> and the, but again, this is uh, what this technological. So there are reasoners they can do abduction. There mm -hmm. are languages that uh, can handle it. So we have many building blocks to build such system. Yes, yes. And um, are you excited about the prospect of neurosymbolic architectures or are, are you still very old school and, and you like these explicit knowledge representations? Oh, that is a different, difficult question. So, yes, I'm very excited by what is happening. I, yeah. I was skeptical about all this uh, natural language pr processing. We tried to work with NLP people, and the results always were quite disappointing how much useful information they actually could extract. And then such leap, <laughs> such progress. So, of course, it is exciting, and we're already starting using it in our scientific work. So, at the same time, I believe there is a place for this very clean, crisp model, just because you you need something as simple as possible just to enable reasoning. Mm -hmm. Just because all these uh, reasoning engines, uh, they are powerful, but if they can reason over simpler structures, so there is more chances <laughs> they will do it. <laughs> Exactly. But so for for, the, for, for practical uh, purposes, <laughs> <laughs> from all my experience, the, the cleaner you can get it, the better it works. But uh, yes. ultimately, when we have more technological progress, then we probably will be able more reflect uh, how it is in our brain. <laughs> Yes, but there's also robustness and reliability and trustworthiness. Precisely. And, yeah. So you actually then can uh, explain how yes. it was done. So this explainability, it's all mm. trustworthy. So if people understand how it works, if we can explain this is how it happened, this is what was taken as input, this is how it was done, and people will trust it more. And especially like systems that we are working, like applications for cancer research. And what what doctor would recommend this uh, drugs if they don't understand how this system came up with these suggestions. Yes, yes. So, and again, the cleaner your representation, the easier to explain it. I know. I, I really agree with you. The, the only intuition I have is that if we're designing a, a novel molecule, for example, mm -hmm. even if we knew or could understand how it was created, would we really understand it? It seems so complicated, doesn't it? It is. It is. Um, but again, there are different logics. So, for example, fuzzy logic, you can yes. build system around that. So, ultimately, let, let's try to build more such systems, and uh, then you just force to understand. So, if you can build it, then you understand how it's working. Yes. Inevitably. Yeah. So I still believe that some portion, important portion of this can be modeled something probably not in any near future. It's just too complex, <laughs> too fuzzy. <laughs> Larissa, it's been an absolute honor. How can people find out more about you and, and what you're up to? 
we actually very bad with uh, telling about what we are doing. That is why I'm so glad that you invited me to talk about it. We just buried in our work and the best we will publish our scientific papers and it is where we stop. Uh, yes, you teach students, you tell students it's based on your research, you use examples, but apart from that we don't do much and we are really quite, quite keen to change it. <laughs> I know. I, I think a lot of people are intimidated by papers and science. And if only people knew how many fascinating ideas there are in there, I think they just need a hook. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's so interesting. No, I blame scientists. They keep this complicated language, even if sometimes they don't need it. So they just they keep people away <laughs> from it. <laughs> Yes, indeed. No, I think scientists should do more about explaining their work, how they are doing it. I always thought that we are doing our work, someone else will. <laughs> so full that AI associated uh, problems, but uh, no, it's actually us who have to do it <laughs> and explain and tell and also warn. Yeah, well, now people can ask GPT for. But what it generates, it's not always correct. <laughs> it, that's true. It's not, but it's um, it's quite good. It's good. It's, it's very impressive. Good. It's very impressive. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's yes. quite good. Larissa, it's been an honor. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm so impressed by how much you know and understand. Oh, Just, really? Wow. Oh, yeah. How I am. Um... Many people around know abduction. Come on. Oh well, I we heard... we are a computer science podcast. I think it's one of the most fundamental things in because you know, um, going yes. back to Aristotle, um, mm -hmm. you know, with the the weak syllogisms and the strong syllogisms, mm -hmm. and and you know, I I, I think of um, induction is actually quite interesting because most people use it mm -hmm. to include abduction, um, so not only creating the map to the hypothesis mm -hmm. space, but actually, um, you know, abduction is just creating the plausible. Hypothesis. I completely agree because if you clear about it, so you clear about logic, so you can have fuzzy concept, all this probabilistic, but yes. underlying logic must be crisp. You, yeah. you, you need to understand. And if it's abduction, precisely, it's only with some probability that it's correct. Exactly. 